Yeah, for those of you who don't know me, my name's Henry Thrawn. I'm one of the Torah commentators here. Now, uh, a few weeks ago, I did a message on slavery, which was uh, started out as a commentary, and I did a lot of research for it. And so then I was able to just use all that research for a full-length message. And uh, I did the same thing with this message. It was originally a commentary, but I had done a lot of reading and compiled a lot of uh, scripture for it. And... Uh, I had enough for a full-length message. But I was unable to give that original commentary here at Corner Fringe because service was canceled that day due to weather. And, and actually, it probably snowed more today than that day, it's, it turned out. But it, ju it just happens. It's, it's okay. And actually, I think the timing is, uh, I mean, the timing is definitely better as we're now in the season of God's holy appointed days. Had a the Feast of Trumpets a couple weeks ago, the Day of Atonement earlier this week, and we'll be starting Sukkot. Now, in Numbers 28 and 29, and also uh, when it lists, uh, in Leviticus 23, where it lists the uh, holy days, God commanded when the offerings were to be given. There were daily offerings, and then extras for the Sabbaths and for the feast days. The early chapters of Leviticus talk about what the offerings consisted of, the fact they were given in front of the tent of meeting, and they talked about the Levites who helped. And so, for those who aren't familiar, like when uh, the Israelites were moving uh, after they left Egypt in the Exodus, and before they entered the Promised Land, they would set up the tabernacle of meeting, and the, all the tribes would uh, set up their tents and their homes around it, and it was at the center of their camp. Let's see, So, God's people, they spent a lot of time with these offerings. And it's even more so this time of year with the feasts. Now, I'd like to try to get a sense of what it was like back then. Now, first, let's read some passages about the tabernacle. So with, we have Sukkot coming up, as I mentioned, uh, which is the Feast of Tabernacles. However, the Hebrew word used for God's tabernacle isn't Sukkah. It's Mishan. Exodus 26.1, Moreover, you shall make the, a tabernacle with ten curtains of fine woven linen and blue, purple, and scarlet thread with artistic designs of carabim, and you shall, weave them, you shall weave them. So the tabernacle was made up of these curtains. This chapter continues to give instructions for other coverings that would go over these curtains until we get to verse uh, 31. You shall make a veil woven of blue, purple and scarlet thread, and fine woven linen. It shall be woven with an artistic design of carabim. Okay, so this veil separated the holy place from the most holy place inside of the tabernacle. Verse 36, you shall make a screen for the door of the tabernacle, woven of blue, purple, and scarlet thread, and fine woven linen made by a weaver. So that's the screen we can see in the front there. This uh, picture doesn't show the coverings, but you can see the inside where the, the separating veil would be. And also, in 3818, the screen for the gate of the court was woven of blue, purple, and scarlet thread and of fine woven linen. So we see these colors were all over the inside of this tabernacle and were used for its entrances. They were also used for the garments of ministry. Exodus 39.1, of the blue, purple, and scarlet thread, they made garments of ministry for ministering in the holy place, and made the holy garments for Aaron, as Yahweh, uh, Lord here in English, Yahweh is the Hebrew, had commanded Moses. He made the ephod of gold, blue, purple, and scarlet thread, and of fine woven linen. And they beat the gold into thin sheets and cut it into threads, to work it in with the blue, purple, and scarlet thread, and the fine linen into artistic designs. They made shoulder straps for it to couple it together. It was coupled together at its two edges. And the intricately woven band of this ephod that was on it was of the same workmanship, woven of gold, blue, purple, and scarlet thread, and of fine woven linen, as Yahweh had commanded Moses. And he made the breastplate artistically woven like the workmanship of the ephod, of gold, blue, purple, and scarlet thread, and of fine woven linen. Verse 24, Exodus 39, 24, 
They made on the hem of the robe pomegranates of blue, purple, and scarlet, and of fine woven linen. And they made bells of pure gold and put the bells between the pomegranates on the hem of the robe all around between the pomegranates. And a sash of fine woven linen with blue, purple, and scarlet thread made by a weaver as Yahweh had commanded Moses. So the tabernacle and the priests were covered in these colors, inside and out, layer upon layer. The tabernacle was where the priests and the people would meet with God. It's where his presence dwelt when the Israelites traveled in the wilderness. And now we've talked before in the past about how it's prophetic of Yeshua, of God dwelling with and moving with his people. In John 1.14, it says the word became flesh and dwelt with his people. And that the Greek word for dwelt means tabernacled. So when people approached the tabernacle, God's dwelling place, and when they looked at the high priests, God's anointed people, God wanted them to see this combination of colors. Every day, and even more often during the Sabbaths and feasts, God wanted his people seeing these colors associated with him. But why? Why were they so prominent, repeated over and over like we looked at? Were they beautiful colors, and God just wanted these things to look good? Well, 1 Samuel 16, 7, But Yahweh said to Samuel, Do not look at his appearance or at his physical stature, because I have refused him. For Yahweh does not see as man sees, for man looks at the outward appearance, but Yahweh looks at the heart. So how much do we get caught up with outward appearances? We often judge people by the clothes they have, and those judgments are usually based on traditions of men. We think of three-piece suits as being the top formal attire, but that's not what God instructed his priests to wear. And even then, using this passage as an indication of what God cares about, he didn't institute their attire for physical reasons. He cares about what's inside. He cares about what's unseen. In order to get revelation from God, we have to realize that as we read his Torah. As Daniel has talked about before, based on Paul's writings, we need to seek out the spirit of the law, not the letter. So then, what do these particular colors represent? Let's go through the Bible and take a look at how these different colors were used elsewhere, individually, to help us see what they were meant to convey when they were combined. Let's start with the first one listed, blue. The Hebrew for blue is tekelet. The Strong's here gives a definition as uh, violet thread. Wikipedia states, it gives a uh, blue violet or blue or turquoise, and it says it's a blue dye highly prized by ancient Mediterranean civilizations and mentioned 49 times in the Hebrew Bible or Tanakh, or the, New, the uh, Old Testament. So between these two definitions, we get kind of a small range of colors. Now, I don't know for sure what shade or shades of blue are used, but we can look through Scripture to see how it was used and what it represents. There's a specific passage where God says what blue should remind us of, the passage about our church's namesake, the corner fringes, or zitzits. Numbers 15, 38. Speak to the children of Israel. Tell them to make tassels on the corners of their garments throughout their generations and to put a blue thread in the tassels of the corners. Now, a few years ago, back in the old building in Osseo, Daniel did a teaching on the tzitzits and the spirit of this law. It's on our YouTube channel in the one-part teaching playlist, and I highly recommend it. I believe this study today is a great companion to that teaching and Daniel's conclusions in it. So continue to verse 39. And you shall have the tassel, that you may look upon it and remember all the commandments of Yahweh and do them and that you may not follow the harlotry to which your own heart and your own eyes are inclined, and that you may remember and do all my commandments and be holy for your God. So these tassels with blue were to remind God's people of his commandments and to do them. What could this color represent in the natural? Well, I don't think it's any coincidence the biggest thing we can see, the sky, is blue, usually. So why is the sky blue? Well, I believe it's to constantly remind us to do God's commandments and to be holy to him. It's a constant, inescapable reminder of God's Torah and of Yeshua. The book of John 
tells us that Jesus is the light. When we have light, we see the blueness of the sky. It's like how Yeshua shows us the holy nature of God. When we don't have light, when we don't have Jesus, the sky is dark. We can't have true holiness and obedience to God without light, without Yeshua. So why would blue remind us of God's commandments? Well, because it's used in the Torah a lot. We've already looked at how it's used with purple and scarlet to cover God's habitation and God's people. It's also used on its own in several places. Some of those we'll look at later, but there's a passage in Numbers 4 I'd like to look at now. And we'll be coming back to this passage uh, as we proceed later on, too. Verse 4, this is a service of the sons of Kohath in the tabernacle of meeting relating to the most holy things. When the camp prepares to journey, Aaron and his sons shall come, and they shall take down the covering veil and cover the ark of the testimony with it. So when the Israelites were in the wilderness, they did quite a bit of traveling. At these times, the Levites would move the holy items, the ones that were inside the tabernacle and in the courtyard. They would have to disassemble them and prepare them per these instructions for transport. The different groups of Levites, the Kohathites, Gershonites, and Murrites, each had their own responsibilities. We'll be looking at some of the Kohathites' responsibilities, which included transporting the tabernacle artifacts. Here it mentions the covering veil and the ark. Verse 6, verse 6. Then they shall put on it a covering of badger skins and spread over that a cloth entirely of blue, and they shall insert its poles. On the table of showbread, they shall spread a blue cloth and put on it the dishes, the pans, the bowls, and the pitchers for pouring, and the showbread shall be on it. And they shall take a blue cloth and cover the lampstand of the light with its lamps, its wick trimmers, its trays, and all its oil vessels with which they service it. Then they shall put it with all its utensils in a covering of badger skins and put it on a carrying beam. Over the golden altar, they shall spread a blue cloth and cover it with a covering of badger skins and they shall insert its poles. And verse 12, then they shall take all the utensils of service with which they minister in the sanctuary, put them in a blue cloth, cover them with a covering of badger skins and put them on a carrying beam. So all these sacred items which the Torah spends quite a bit of time describing, and which were central components to the worship of God, were covered with blue cloth and badger skins when the Israelites traveled. This should remind us of Shua because he walked amongst us, like the way God's tabernacle, his dwelling place, traveled with his people back then. Now, just a quick note, Daniel and I were discussing the badger skins and whether or not they were actually badger skins. Different translations use different English words and there are different rabbinic commentaries on what that Hebrew word actually means. I won't be getting into any more detail with those today, but I wanted to share this passage as it demonstrates the use of the color blue. It also discusses the purple and scarlet as well, which we will be looking at next. So now that we see blue represents God's commandments, his Torah, let's go to the other end of the three colors and discuss scarlet. If we look at it in the Hebrew, it's actually two words used together. The first word is tola, which is translated worm or scarlet stuff, according to Bible Hub. The English translations don't indicate this word is even there. Here are some other examples from Scripture of this word being used. Exodus 16, 19. And Moses said, Let no one leave any bread till morning, notwithstanding they did not heed Moses, but some of them left part of it until morning, and it bred worms and stank. And Moses was angry with them. So this was when the Israelites were instructed to gather all the manna they needed in the morning. Got Deuteronomy 28, 39. You shall plant vineyards and tend them, but you shall neither drink of the wine nor gather the grapes, for the worms shall eat them. This was listed among the curses of disobeying God. In Jonah 4, 6. And Yahweh God prepared a plant and made it come up over Jonah that it might be shade for his head to deliver him from his misery. So Jonah was very grateful for the plant. But as morning dawned, the next day God prepared a worm, and it so damaged the plant that it withered. Now this is at the end of the book of Jonah, when Jonah was angry that the Ninevites repented. Now these are just some of the deliberate uses of this word to demonstrate that it means worm or grub. 
Now, the second of the two Hebrew words translated as scarlet is scarlet, uh, or in the Hebrew, shani. So this word would indicate a color. And here are a couple examples of it used by itself in the Tanakh. Genesis thirty-eight twenty-seven. Now it came to pass at the time for giving birth that, behold, twins were in Tamar's womb. And so it was when she was giving birth that the one put out his hand, and the midwife took a scarlet thread and bound it on his hand, saying, this one came out first. Then it happened as he drew back his hand that his brother came out unexpected, unexpected, unexpectedly, and she said, how did you break through? This breach be upon you. Therefore, his name was called Perez. Afterward, his brother came out who had the scarlet thread on his hand, and his name was called Zerah. And here's another example. Song of Solomon 4. Your lips are like a strand of scarlet, and your mouth is lovely. Your temples behind your veil are like a piece of pomegranate. So combined, the two Hebrew words are tola shani, or tolat in the plural, a word pair which can be translated scarlet worm or crimson worm. Now, every time I check the Hebrew of the three colors, the blue, purple, and scarlet, both of these words were used for scarlet. Like the examples we just looked at, I found, I found several passages where these words were used separately, showing that tola is indeed a worm, a red worm, while shani is the color itself. One verse that makes the distinction is a popular one from Isaiah that Craig uh, read uh, at Yom Kippur, in verse 18. Come now and let us reason together, says Yahweh. Though your sins are like scarlet, uh, shani, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, or tola, they shall be as wool. Now the, word, the English word red here uh, is another Hebrew word, a dome. So the line should read, though they are red like a worm. So the Hebrew word tola is a specific species of worm that happens to be red. And putting the two words together, these red worms were used for the dye to color the scarlet items we're reading about. The Temple Institute, who is trying to reconstruct the temple in Jerusalem, is trying to re recreate this dye. Here are some pictures from their website demonstrating it. You can see that it looks kind of like blood, which is appropriate when we see how else it's used by itself in Scripture. There's a commentary on my YouTube channel I did a while back on Leviticus 14 called Leprosy and the Cleansing Blood of Yeshua that talks about how scarlet was used with blood for the cleansing ritual after leprosy. Now, I didn't know it at the time, but the scarlet used there is the same scarlet from the worm that we're reading about. Leviticus 14.3, And the priest shall go out of the camp, and the priest shall examine the leper. And indeed, if the leprosy is healed in the leper, then the priest shall command to take for him who is to be cleansed two living and clean birds, cedar wood, scarlet, and hyssop. And the priest shall command that one of the birds be killed in an earthen vessel over running water. As for the living bird, he shall take it, the cedar wood, and the scarlet, and the hyssop, and dip them and the, living, and the living bird in the blood of the bird that was killed over the running water. So we see the scarlet used with blood uh, and with cleansing of lepers, of people. Later in this chapter we read, verse 48, But if the priest comes in and examines it, and indeed the plague has not spread in the house after the house was plastered, then the priest shall pronounce the house clean, because the plague is healed. And he shall take to cleanse the house two birds, cedarwood, scarlet, and hyssop. Then he shall kill one of the birds in an earthen vessel over running water. And he shall take the cedarwood, the hyssop, the scarlet, and the living bird, and dip them in the blood of the slain bird, and in the running water, and sprinkle the house seven times. He shall cleanse the house with the blood of the bird, and the running water, and the living bird, with the cedarwood, the hyssop, and the scarlet. So we also see the scarlet and the blood used to cleanse homes. It's kind of like we're looking at the people, the priests, and the tabernacle, God's home. So we see the physical significance of this color. It represents blood. Now let's look at the prophetic significance of it. There are teachings about the scarlet worm that show how it's prophetic of Jesus' crucif crucifixion. Let's look at this quote from, uh, from him while he was on the cross. Matthew 27, 46. 
And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. That is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? This is also in Mark 15, 34. Yeshua is referencing scripture here, Psalm 22. Verse 1, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from helping me? And from the words of my groaning, oh my God, I cry in the daytime, but you do not hear. And in the night season, and I'm not silent. So this passage is about Yeshua on the cross. Here it sounds like he is crying out in despair, but if we continue, but you are holy, enthroned in the praises of Israel. Our fathers trusted in you. They trusted, and you delivered them. They cried to you, and were delivered. They trusted in you, and were not ashamed. So Jesus is declaring the faithfulness of the Father. And if we continue to the next verse, but I am a worm, and no man, a reproach of men, and despised by the people. Now the English word here in the Hebrew is tola. So Jesus was calling himself a scarlet worm. And now I'd like to look at one of the teachings I found about how the physical characteristics of this worm are prophetic of Yeshua and his crucifixion. This is from Henry Morris. When the female of the scarlet worm species was ready to give birth to her young, she would attach her body to the trunk of a tree, fixing herself so firmly and permanently that she would never leave again. The eggs deposited beneath her body were thus protected until the larvae were hatched and able to enter their own life cycle. As the mother died, the crimson fluid stained her body and the surrounding wood. From the dead bodies of such female scarlet worms, the commercial scarlet dyes of antiquity were extracted. What a picture this gives of Christ dying on the tree, shedding his precious blood that he might bring many sons unto glory. He died for us, that we might live through him. Psalm 22, 6 describes such a worm and gives us this picture of Christ. Now, scarlet was also present leading up to the actual crucifixion. Matthew 27, 28. And the soldiers of the governor stripped Jesus and put a scarlet robe on him. While I was putting this together, I checked the Greek words for the New Testament colors and I also checked the Greek words used for the colors in the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Old Testament. The ones I looked at were a match, indicating these are the same colors being discussed in the Torah. So we see how the scarlet is prophetic of Yeshua's blood and how it's sacrificial blood. Remember how we looked at the use of blue in Numbers 4 when uh, transporting the tabernacle? The scarlet from the worm shows up once. Verse 7 On the table of showbread, they shall spread a blue cloth and put on it the dishes, the pans, the bowls, and the pitchers for pouring, and the showbread shall be on it. They shall spread over them a scarlet cloth and cover the same with a covering of badger skins, and they shall insert its poles. Now, the first showbread here is in Hebrew is hapanim, which actually means the face, or more appropriately in this case, the presence. Now, the second showbread is indeed the Hebrew word for bread, lechem. So this passage shows the sacrificial aspect of the bread. Look at what Yeshua said in John 6, verse 48. I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness and are dead. This is the bread which comes down from heaven, that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I shall give is my flesh, which I shall give for the life of the world. So the scarlet used in the sacrifices and on the table of showbread were prophetic of how Yeshua's sacrificial flesh and blood would be bread that gives us everlasting life. This isn't physical bread like the manna the Israelites ate in the wilderness. This is spiritual bread that gives us eternal life after this life. Now let's look at the purple, which is argamon in the Hebrew. Bible Hub shows it can mean red-purple, kind of like how tekelet can mean blue-violet. We see purple used in the Tanakh in reference to royalty, like after Gideon defeated Midian. Judges 8.26. 
Now the weight of the gold earrings that Gideon requested was 1,700 shekels of gold, besides the crescent arm, uh, ornaments, pendants, and purple robes which were on the kings of Midian, and besides the chains that were around their camels' necks. So we see the kings of Midian wearing the purple. In Proverbs, when talking about a virtuous wife, 3121, she is not afraid of snow for her household, for all her household is clothed with scarlet. She makes tapestry for herself. Her clothing is fine linen and purple. And in Song of Solomon, talking about his palanquin, which is a portable enclosed chair. 310, Solomon the king made the palanquin's pillars of silver, its support of gold, its seat of purple, its interior paved with love by the daughters of Jerusalem. And one more example from Song of Solomon to show how purple was considered exquisite. In 7.5, your heart crowns you like Mount Carmel and the hair of your head is like purple. A king is held captive by your tresses. Now every time I found the three colors listed, it was always in the order blue, purple, scarlet. Those of us studying Hebrew have learned the order of words is usually not as important to its structure like the order of English words are when speaking English, when using the English structure. However, I don't think this was a coincidence. Consider the relationships of the colors. Consider that mixing blue and red or scarlet gives you purple. I'm speaking in simple terms. There are different shades and there are differences when discussing pigmentation versus light, etc. But I believe this is an indicator that these three colors are meant to be connected. Like when we looked at the definitions of blue and red and they included purple, we, t we see a transition. I thought of those uh, paint jobs that look like different colors when the light hits it at different angles. It's like the blue and red flow into each other through the purple. We see royalty being a combination of the commandments of God and sacrificial blood, everything that Yeshua embodied. Look at what he said about the law. Matthew 5, 17. Do not think that I came to destroy the law or the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For assuredly, I say to you, till heaven and earth pass away, one jot or one tittle will by no means pass from the law till all is fulfilled. Whoever therefore breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches men so sh shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does and teaches them he shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. And also, in John 14, 15, if you love me, keep my commandments. And we read about his blood in Luke twenty two twenty. Likewise, Jesus also took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you. And about being a king, we read in Matthew 27, 11. Now Jesus stood before the governor, and the governor asked him, saying, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus said to him, It is as you say. So we see how all these colors are linked to represent Yeshua and how he would die for us. Blue, he kept and taught God's commandments. Purple, he's king of kings. Scarlet, his blood would be shed for us. Now there's one place I found purple by itself in the Torah. is in the Numbers 4 section we've been looking at. Verse 13, also they shall take away the ashes from the altar and spread a purple cloth over it. The altar is where all the sacrifices occurred. So the spot for sacrifices had a purple cloth laid on it. It was symbolic of royalty, a king being sacrificed. We see all this amazing symbolism of Yeshua and his sacrifice to give us life. And do not forget where we see all this, in and on God's tabernacle and God's people. This is all prophetic of how God himself would come to earth and die for our sins. God's name itself is prophetic of this. I once did a message about the name of God. Uh, Wikipedia, the, te the tetragrammaton, meaning four letters, is a Hebrew theonym, yod heh vav -he, commonly transliterated into Latin letters as Y-H-W-H. -H. So in transliteration, you, what you do is you just take the letter from one language that has the same sound of the original language and replace it uh, with that letter. So the yod makes a y sound, the he makes h sound, and the, va, uh, the vav or wa makes a w sound. 
It is one of the names of the God of Israel used in the Hebrew Bible. In the King James and New King James Old Testaments, whenever you see the English word Lord in all capital letters, the Hebrew word is actually the Tetragrammaton, the yod heh vav or Yahweh. So here are the meanings of each of the letters of Yahweh. We have the Yod, which can mean arm or enclosed hand. And we have the He, which is a man with arms raised, like in the earlier pictures. Uh, this is a kind of the transition of the Hebrew letters. And can mean look or reveal or breathe. And then the Wa or Vav is like a tent peg. So when we put these together, we get the Yod He, Vav He, hand, behold, nail, behold. So God's name contains the way he was going to die for our sins. John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. Verse 14, and the word became flesh and dwelt, or tabernacled, among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So these truths were hidden in plain sight in God's tabernacle structure, now that we have recorded accounts of Jesus' life, we can see what these laws meant. Purple was also present leading up to the actual crucifixion. Mark 15, 16. Then the soldiers led him away into the hall called Praetorium, and they called together the whole garrison, and they clothed him with purple, and they twisted a crown of thorns and put it on his head, and began to salute him, Hail, King of the Jews! They clothed Yeshua with purple to mock him because they didn't believe he was an actual king. Then they struck him on the head with the reed and spat on him. And bowing the knee, they worshipped him. And when they had mocked him, they took the purple off him, put his own clothes on him, and led him out to crucify him. So now we read in earlier in Matthew that it was a scarlet robe. So is this a contradiction? Well, remember the picture of the car? I think that's what's going on here, that the scarlet and purple are blending, and it could probably be accurately referred to either way, more so over in this area as opposed to like the purple over here. So these colors show how intertwined God's royalty and sacrifice are. The king of the Jews would sacrifice himself for us. If the color is, um, if the color is in the range where it could look purple or scarlet, it probably means it didn't look like it was blue at all. So since blue represents God's commandments, this would be fitting since Jesus died because of our lawlessness. 1 Corinthians 15.3 For I delivered to you first of all that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. While looking through the verses about these colors, the ones I found that contained purple and scarlet without blue were a bit scary for me. Revelation 17.3, so he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast, which was full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. The woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet, and adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls, having in her hand a golden cup full of abominations and the filthiness of her fornication. So why would, why would these colors be revealed to John? Like with the scarlet for the beast, I'm thinking it's probably like Isaiah when it equates scarlet with sin. And so maybe for the woman, the, that could be the same meaning of scarlet, and the purple could be royalty. Now, I can't say for sure, but after going through this study, I believe it's because this woman represents something that looks like the church, except for one thing. It's missing the blue. It's missing God's commandments. Let's continue and see what she does. And on her forehead, a name was written, Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and of, ab of the abominations of the earth. I saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I marveled with great amazement. So this lawless facsimile will be an enemy and persecutor of the saints. Skipping ahead, verse 17. For God has put it into the people's hearts to fulfill his purpose to be of one mind and to give their kingdom to the beast until the words of God are fulfilled. And the woman whom you saw is that great city which reigns over the kings of the earth. So this woman represents a great lawless city. But going to the next chapter, the tables are turned. Revelation 18.11. And the merchants of the earth will weep and mourn over her, 
For no one buys their merchandise anymore. Merchandise of gold and silver, precious stones and pearls, fine linen and purple, silk and scarlet, every kind of citron wood, every kind of object of ivory, every kind of object of most precious wood, bronze, iron, and marble. So these merchants are selling items that are used in the tabernacle, in the temple, and in God's army. But again, we don't see any blue. Verse 15, the merchants of these things who became rich by her will stand at a distance for fear of her torment, weeping and wailing and saying, alas, alas, that great city that was clothed in fine linen and purple and scarlet and adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls. So these merchants got rich by the lawless woman. This makes me think of uh, working on Sabbaths and breaking God's law to gain wealth. Verse 19, they threw dust on their heads and cried out, weeping and wailing and saying, Alas, alas, that great city in which all who had ships on the sea became rich by her wealth. For in one hour she is made desolate. Rejoice over her, O heaven, and you holy apostles and prophets, for God has avenged you on her. So God will have victory over the lawless. We have to cling to God and his commandments to get through persecution from the lawless. We have to be storing up our treasures in heaven, not on earth like the merchants we just read about. So let's go back to other uses of blue in Torah to see symbolism of how God's law holds everything together. It had special, pur uh, see, it had special purposes among the blue, purple, and scarlet articles we've discussed. Exodus 26.1, uh, we looked at earlier. Moreover, you shall make the tabernacle with ten curtains of fine woven linen and blue, purple, and scarlet thread. With artistic designs of carabim, you shall weave them. The length of each curtain shall be 28 cubits, and the width of each curtain, four cubits. And every one of the curtains shall have the same measurements. Five curtains, bound, uh, shall, be, five curtains shall be coupled to one another, and the other, other five curtains shall be coupled to one another. And you shall make loops of blue, of blue yarn on the edge of the curtain on the selvage of one set, and likewise you shall do on the outer edge of the other curtain of the second set. So the blue held together the curtains that com comprised his earthly habitation and allowed us to meet with him. We need to obey his commandments, the blue representing God's commandments. We need to obey them for our bodies to spiritually be held together as a place for the Holy Spirit to dwell. Without the blood of Yeshua and God's commandments, we are not suitable tabernacles for him. Exodus 39, 21. And they bound the breastplate by means of its rings to the rings of the ephod with a blue cord so that it would be above the intricately woven band of the ephod and that the breastplate would not come loose from the ephod as Yahweh had commanded Moses. So the blue connected the breastplate and the breastplate contained the names of the sons of Israel on its stones. They were inscribed on the stones that were in the breastplate the, the blue kept this breastplate on the priest's ephod. So with the priest dressed in God's colors and representing him, we see the blue cords connected the people of Israel to him. So God's Torah is what connects God's people to him. Verse 22, he made the robe of the ephod of, wo of woven work, all of blue. God's Torah connected the blue, purple, and scarlet to the priest. Like with the tabernacle curtains, the blue is what kept the colors together. God's law kept the colors connected to his priests. It connects Yeshua to his people. Like we read earlier, if we love him, we'll obey his commandments. Verse 30. Then they made the plate of the holy crown of pure gold and wrote on it an inscription like the engraving of a signet, holiness to Yahweh. And they tied it to a blue cord to fasten it above on the turban as Yahweh had commanded Moses. So God's law is what puts praise of his name on our foreheads. Daniel's done teachings on this when contrasting the mark of the beast with the mark of God. So get Deuteronomy 6.8. You shall bind these words which I command as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. So the frontlets, his commandments, were to be placed about the same spot the blue cord was fastening the signet. The most important thing for us to do to praise God is to keep his commandments on our minds and live them out. When our thoughts and actions are dedicated to the Torah, 
Then we declare holiness to the Lord, holiness to Yahweh. So to sum up the colors, they're all about Yeshua. They're all about Jesus. When God gathered his people to himself every day, and more so during the feasts, to give him offerings, it was to give offerings to Yeshua. He wanted them to think of these colors whenever they thought of him because they demonstrated how and why he would come to the earth. And when people come into our tent during the revival, they need to see Yeshua there. They need to see him when they see us, his servants. They won't see the physical colors. We need to show them spiritually by sharing the love of Christ. So let's break these colors down again. The law, the royalty, and the blood of Yeshua all intertwine. The statutes of the Torah call for sacrifice of blood for remission of sin and spiritual cleansing. The purple indicates true royalty as composed of sacrificial blood and the law together. God's royalty is made up of his commandments and his sacrifice. The Torah is what states these truths. And without it, the blood sacrifice would be meaningless. And without the royal blood sacrifice, the Torah would not be fulfilled. It's what Daniel had What's what uh, Pastor Daniel has called the structure of the faith. Revelation 14, 12. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. These colors and what they represent also reminded me of Craig's message a few weeks ago. Yeshua's blood justifies us by washing us of our sins, by cleansing us. By his grace, we will mature in his word and his commandments, the process of sanctification. And finally, we'll be glorified, as John mentions in Revelation. 1.5, to Jesus Christ, who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood and has made us kings and priests to his God and Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. So we see why the priests wore these colors. Because Yeshua's law and his blood are what make us priests and royalty. The blood fulfills the law and washes us from our sin, which is called lawlessness in 1 John 3, 4. Now, I'm almost going to wrap up here. While studying for this and reading about blood, I decided to do some reading on its color. So if blood is red, why are veins blue? The heart pumps blood to your lungs to pick up oxygen. The oxygen-rich blood is then pumped out to your body through your arteries. It's bright red at this point. So here the blood has plenty of life-giving oxygen. From your arteries, the blood flows through tiny blood vessels called capillaries, where it gives up its oxygen to the body's tissues. Your blood, now exhausted of its oxygen, is dark red as it now returns to your heart through your veins. So the blood has lost the oxygen. It reminds me of sin, how disobeying God's commands takes life from us. However, Let's look at what happens to the blood in the veins. Blood is always red, actually. Veins look blue because light has to penetrate the skin to illuminate them. Blood and red light, being of different wavelengths, penetrate with different degrees of success. What makes it back to your eye is the blue light. I believe this ties in with Daniel Zitzi teaching from years ago that I mentioned earlier, when he pointed out the connection between the blue of the corner fringes and the blue of our veins. The red blood looks blue because of light. It's like how Yeshua, the light of the world, makes us look righteous by washing away our sins. We see in this study how God's Torah, like the blue, purple, and scarlet, and his very creation, like the scarlet worm, and our own blood, point to his gospel. 1 John 1.7 But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. The colors of the tabernacle and Levitical garments in the Old Covenant show us how God's kingdom works in the spiritual. God's people spent a lot of time and energy meeting with God and delivering offerings. Now, for us to walk out the Torah under the New Covenant, we need to be doing the same spiritually. We need to be approaching our high priest, Yeshua, on a greater than daily basis. We need to offer him our time and energy in prayer and praise and worship. And we need to do it even more on the Sabbaths and more at his appointed holy days. We need to offer him our best in singing 
and adoration and in our time devoted to him. Then we will see revival. Shabbat shalom. And, and now we'll, uh, we'll go into a time of prayer if uh, the worship team can come back up. And I uh, believe we'll have our usual people. If you, need, if you have any prayer needs, they'll be uh, standing on the sides here and in the back. You can come talk to them and pray with them. Um, oh, and uh, I just wanted to remind everyone, uh, uh, Dan Pumala, I believe his name was, who spoke last week from, uh, from uh, the Outpost Ministries. So tonight is his... Uh, called out of the darkness praise and worship event. Uh, it's from 7 to 9. And so if, uh, if anyone, I'm, I'm planning to go, my family's going. So if anyone would like to come and you don't have the information they handed out last week, uh, you can see me and I've got a card here I can fill you in. So, so I'll just close this out in prayer. Oh, Father God, we, uh, we thank you for your son Yeshua, for his cleansing blood. And we, and we need it, Lord. We just ask that you wash us and cleanse us and we can have fellowship with you. And Father, we, uh, we pray for this revival coming up as we know that the enemy is, is in attack mode, but we see you're working, we see you're moving. We just honor you and glorify you for that, Lord. We thank you for using us as your hands and feet. And we just uh, pray for your protection, uh, for your provision as, as, this, as we do this revival, that the people who come would see you in their midst when they're there in the tent that you would meet us there, that you would uh, set the captives free, that you would uh, raise the spiritually dead, Lord, that you would heal the afflicted, Lord. And uh, Father, I just, uh, just uh, lift the rest of this time up to you and uh, just, uh, again, thank you and honor you. And it's in Yeshua's name we pray. Amen. <laughs>